This video is going to be discussing abiogenesis. Um, first, I'd like to clear up a couple common misconceptions, the first of which being spontaneous generation. Now, spontaneous generation is completely different from abiogenesis in both the time frame and mechanism by which it occurs. Um, Pasteur, of course, disproved spontaneous generation, but he said absolutely nothing about abiogenesis. The only thing that Pasteur proved was that when meat is not exposed to air, it won't get maggots. And how that can possibly relate to abiogenesis is, of course, anybody's guess. Um, second of all is the probability thing, because we've all heard creationists comment on how exactly improbable and how impossible it is that abiogenesis happened. It's impossible. Well, they also tend to have a fundamental misunderstanding of it in the sense of when they look at probability, they take the probability of what are the odds that a man evolved from an ant. Well, of course, that, that wouldn't happen, but here's a helpful analogy to help you kind of understand the flaws in the thinking and exactly how evolution and abiogenesis would work. Um, could a baby suddenly evolve into a, or give birth to, a, a man? No, that doesn't happen whatsoever. It takes many years for a baby to turn into a man, each with small successive highly probable steps turning into a big step. So it's small changes over time lead to large changes over a long period of time. And when you understand exactly how that works, you'll understand the fundamental flaw in that probability calculation. You'll also understand exactly how abiogenesis and evolution work. Another common misconception is that, well, if what's needed for life now, in complex life, was needed for life in the beginning, and that's not the case. For example, we need lungs and a heart to live. Yet, does that mean that all organisms do? No. In fact, the majority of organisms on this planet don't have lungs or a heart, and they live just fine. So that you need to be careful about um, commenting on that, too. So what might be necessary, we might have, you know thousands of or hundreds of proteins, hundreds of thousands of proteins necessary for us to live. But does that mean that the simplest life forms needed it? Absolutely not. In fact, the, the simplest self-replicating systems didn't have DNA or proteins. They simply used RNA, as I'll discuss here in a minute. So without further ado, this is exactly how life could have formed on Earth. I'm actually going to begin by discussing um, RNA and its function and the neat things about it before I actually go into um, the structure of, of actual replicating cells. So um, bear with me there, it's a little bit backwards, but I think that it's necessary to give you information about RNA before I discuss why it's needed to compartmentalize. As a little preface, I would highly recommend viewing my Evidence or Understanding Evolution 3 video, which is on DNA, and I touch slightly on RNA, um, just to kind of give you a background as, as to exactly how it works. But RNA is essentially very similar to DNA, but there are a couple profound differences that are important. Um, it is a means of storing genetic material. However, it's not present in the typical double helix form. Um, RNA is typically single-stranded, so it's lacking the, the paired strand. And the advantage of this is that it allows RNA to form into complicated, neat, three-dimensional structures. Um, another fundamental difference is that um, in DNA, it's ATCG, whereas in RNA, it's AUGC. So the T is being replaced with a U, and that's another important thing to um, understand. And lastly, the only other real difference is that um, RNA has a hydroxyl group that, or an OH group. It's basically an oxygen that DNA doesn't on the phosphate sugar background, and that's really the only other fundamental difference. But the, the first genetic material was most likely RNA, and it was extremely important and played an influential role in forming the primitive cell. Now, one of the fascinating things about RNA is that in addition to storing genetic information, it can also form and, and fold in a certain way, as the prior animation showed you, and become what's called a ribozyme, which is an enzyme. Um, this was actually the, what caused the, the, the winning of the 1989 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. It's very important. Um, these ribozymes are actual enzymes. Now, the, the tetrahymena ribozyme is able to actually cleave RNA strands into two smaller pieces. So this double functionality is extremely important, and believe it or not, the, the RNA world hypothesis, that is to say that RNA was the initial genetic material, had been around since the, the, the 60s by three independently... Um, derived people, and none of them had even heard of ribozymes. This was, you know, several years or decades, rather, before ribozymes were even discovered. So this is a strong, strong, strong piece of evidence. Even stronger is the fact that ribosomes um, in, in eukaryotic cells, which um, are the responsible for, and prokaryotic cells, are responsible for changing the, the DNA and RNA into actual proteins, are ribozymes themselves. So this is very powerful um, evidence in the fact that RNA itself not only stores the genetic material, but it also catalyzes its own production, or its own reproduction, and it also um, is a very important enzyme in the cell too, and will later on lead to protein synthesis. This then begs the question, well, how could RNA have formed in the first place? 
Well, clays such as Montmernoline are actually crucial, and they've been experimentally shown to have a charged surface and attract RNA nucleotides. What this does is it catalyzes the polymerization reaction by clumping them together and putting them near each other so that the long chain polymers will form. And this has essentially all been demonstrated in the lab and shown to be completely feasible. And the, the discovery of Montmelanite and this um, polymerization capability has actually been pretty impressive. Um, another possibility um, is that RNA could have formed from salty ice water. Um, it's been shown in the University of California that when you freeze a dilute solution of RNA nucleotides, um, as, as the ice crystals begin to form, the RNA gets pushed out and gets concentrated, and this will also polymerize RNA. Both of these methods completely naturally lead to the formation of RNA. Interestingly enough, experiments at a Harvard lab have completely shown that RNA can replicate without enzymes. So no ribozyme whatsoever is needed, and this is, and as this um, animation actually clearly shows, what happens is chemically activated nucleotides will find their complementary place on an existing RNA strand and replicate and make copies from there. So of course, keep in mind the nature of self-replicating systems in the sense of if something is self-replicating, it's going to accumulate by the very nature of it. There's no witchcraft or anything like that involved. That's simply how it works. And this is just a, a wonderful backup um, explanation and to demonstrate that even if um, ribozymes or other um, things to replicate RNA aren't in existence, which would be called replicases, RNA can still make copies of itself. That being said, this is somewhat slow and error prone, so um, a ribozyme, which would make copies of RNA called a replicase, would have probably evolved fairly early. Another amusing fact surrounding this is, if you recall correctly, RNA is single-stranded. However, it can at times um, associate with complementary strands, much in the way DNA does. Well, if these were to separate, like what normally happens at seawater, or at normal sea temperature, um, the one of them would spontaneously fold into a ribozyme, and the other one would serve as a template strand. So this is exactly how protein synthesis today works, only um, replacing the ribozyme with the ribosome, which they're very similar to begin with. So this is just another piece of evidence kind of to stack on the pile. The next question comes about, well, why does life need a membrane compartment? And there are several answers for this. One of these is that the um, replicases will not only replicate each other, but they'll also replicate any RNA that they come in contact with. And over time, if you're not in a sequestered environment, the replicases will clearly become outnumbered, and you're going to be left with just a bunch of RNA and very little things to replicate it. But uh, creating a mini-environment inside a larger one is, is extremely important, and it's the fundamental um, backbone of, of biology today, and it allows compartmentalization and all sorts of other things to occur. So now I'll be examining exactly how this compartmentalization could have come about to begin with. Fatty acids provide the, the essential backbone for membrane, membrane compartments in the, the natural world, but the question arises, where do these fatty acids form? And the likely answer for this would be in deep sea hydrothermal vents. Now, mineral surfaces can catalyze the formation of hydrocarbons from carbon monoxide and hydrogen. These, over time, will accumulate, aggregate, and be released as fatty acids. And this has all been, of course, um, demonstrated multiple times. It's, it's thermodynamically feasible and probable. Ask yourself what happens when you place a drop of oil in water it forms a drop, a circle. You don't have to do anything magic about it, that's simply what happens when you do it. Well, when you place the fatty acids that we've just formed in water, you get what are called micelles. Now, these essentially line up first in a bilayer, but when the bilayers, um, due to just fluctuation in the water, when they reach around and connect at the end, you get what's formed a vesicle, which are extremely stable structures, and they've been known to maintain the same size and shape for several months. Interestingly enough, Montmorillonite clay, if you recall the same clay, which will polymerize the RNA reaction to begin with, also catalyzes vesicle formation. So now we have a basic protocell with two components. It's an RNA replicase and a fatty acid membrane. Now this is extremely basic, but nevertheless, it's subject to growth, replication, and evolution as well. Um, as far as a protocell life cycle is concerned, the two or more replicases will make copies of each other, but it's also prone to mutation. So most of the time when mutations occur, these replicases won't be able to copy the RNA as effectively. However, occasionally, a better replicase may be formed that'll copy it quicker. Furthermore, it could also have a mutation that would cause something, for example, the synthesis of new fatty acids, so it wouldn't rely on the environment to get them. All of these um, possible mutations, because keep in mind this protocell is subject to evolution, would accumulate, and these cells, these protocells with these advantageous mutations would be replicating at a rate higher than those without them, and it's essentially all downhill from there. For further information and clarification on the subject, check out the links that I'm providing in the video description. One is regarding the probability, and it's from a fantastic Talk Origins website, which I may just do a video on later. And the second one is CDK's recent video on abiogenesis.
Thanks again for your time, guys.